Good evening. I'm Craig Blumenschein from Wyoming PBS, and welcome to our Wyoming Perspectives discussion on sage grouse in Wyoming. Temple Stollinger from the University of Wyoming in a policy brief recalled that as a result of declining populations, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service received numerous petitions to list the sage grouse as a threatened or endangered species beginning in 1999. In March of 2010, the Fish and Wildlife Service determined that the greater sage grouse was warranted for listing under the Endangered Species Act, but its listing was precluded by other higher priority listings, making it a candidate species. In its decision, the Fish and Wildlife Services, Service listed habitat fragmentation and the lack of sufficient regulatory mechanisms to conserve sage grouse as the top threats. Under normal circumstances, the Fish and Wildlife Service would have been required to review the sage grouse candidate designation every year to determine if an uplisting or a downlisting was appropriate. However, in, the sept in September of 2010, the Fish and Wildlife Service entered into a settlement agreement with environmental groups prompted by litigation over the agency's fa failure to make sufficient progress on its backlog of 251 candidate species. The terms of the settlement agreement require the Fish and Wildlife Service to either list the sage grouse under the Endangered Species Act or remove it from the candidate list by September of this year. Before we meet our panel, and as a, backdrop, as a backdrop to our conversation this evening, we wanted to learn more about why the film The Sagebrush Sea, which premiered nationally tonight on PBS and was shown on Wyoming PBS, why it was made. Earlier today, I visited with Garrett Vinn, the lead cinematographer on the project. I think his comments will serve as a good framework for our upcoming discussion. My name is Garrett Vinn. I'm one of the cinematographers on the Sagebrush Sea film. We made this film originally because we're fascinated with these birds. The, the sage grouse and other grouse are some of the most fantastic birds we have in North America. And with everything going on with sage grouse, we wanted to really uh, find a way to, to help people to understand the birds better. We thought it was important for people to, to understand some of these things about why do these birds in particular need such large landscapes. and. Uh, other things. We hear a lot of misconceptions about sage grouse when we talk to different people and we wanted to just help people to get to know them better. And so it was building an appreciation for this landscape that many people travel through, uh, tourists and people who live here, but might not really appreciate like you might appreciate someplace like Yellowstone National Park. We as humans use the landscape in many and increasing ways. And while none of these uses are responsible alone for what's happened with sage grouse and, and, and the degradation in places of the sage steppe, we wanted to, to, to build that feeling that, you know, we're all in this together. Many different people are using the landscape in different ways, and they're cumulative. And all of those, those uses have, have, have led to this, this situation. So it's up to all of us, hopefully as a beginning place now, to come together, all, all the different people who use the landscape and value the landscape in different ways, to come together and hopefully start looking at the landscape in a little bit different way uh, so that we can have uh, all of these different uses in a way that are compatible with each other. We have a well-rounded panel assembled here with us tonight to discuss issues relative to sage-grouse conser conservation in Wyoming. And we invite you now to submit your questions to us. We want you to participate. You can call us at 1-800-495-9788, or you can email your questions to us to grouse at wyomingpbs.org. Let me now introduce our panel. First, Mark Dansker is a biologist turned filmmaker from the Cornell, Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And this Sage Rush C is his first film for television. He did his doctoral studies on the sage grouse and finished his doctoral program in 2014. He has since produced several short films and programs for multi-platform educational purposes, but this is his first film to be broadcast on national television. Mark, we are pleased to have you with us tonight. Thanks so much. Holly Copeland is a, is a spatial ecologist, habitat modeler for the Nature Conservancy in Wyoming. Holly works on spatial analysis for statewide and regional threat assessments, mitigation planning, modeling future energy development scenarios, and conservation priorities assessments. She received her undergraduate degree in geography from the University of California, Davis, and her master's in geography from the University of Wyoming, with additional training and courses in geographic information systems and statistics at Duke University and Colorado State University. Copeland has published articles in the Journal of Conservation Planning, Bioscience, and Studies in, a and studies in Aviation, Avian Biology. Holly, welcome. Thank you very much. Paul Ulrich is a 17-year veteran of the oil and gas exploration and production industry. 
He currently serves as Director, Government Affairs and Regulatory for Jonah Energy LLC. Jonah Energy operates in the Jonah Field in Wyoming, one of the largest gas fields in North America. Prior to coming to Jonah Energy, Paul worked at Incana Oil and Gas as a senior advisor. His focus is on new project development, government affairs, regulatory issues, communications, safety, wildlife and air quality, and workforce issues. He currently serves as an oil and gas representative on, on Wyoming Governor Matt Mead's Sage Grouse implementation team and has been there since the team was founded in 2007. Paul has been actively working on sage grouse issues and habitat issues in the West since 1998. Paul, welcome. Thank you. Tom Christensen is the sage grouse coordinator for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, and he's been with the Game and Fish Department for 30 years. Tom is the chairman of the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies Sage and Columbian Sharp-Tailed Grouse Technical Committee, and serves on the range-wide interagency sage grouse conservation team and the Wildfire and Invasive Species Working Group. Tom received his Bachelor's of Science degree in Agriculture and Natural Resources from the University of Nebraska. Tom, we're pleased that you're with us tonight. Thanks, Greg. Mark, I want to start with you, if I, if I could. First, congratulations on the film. Thanks so much. Very exciting. Mark, I'm curious, did you feel pressure to get the film out and available prior to this September announcement that we're waiting for relative to the listing of the sage grouse, and were you able to tell the story that you wanted to tell? I don't know if pressure is the right word, but we knew years ago that this is when we wanted to be out. Uh, this is what we, we decided uh, that we could have an impact really only if we got into this period of time before the listening decision. We wanted to help uh, people understand what's really at stake and whichever way this decision goes, we wanted people to have a, a sensitivity that there was value that's being discussed, not just something in the way, but something valuable that we're discussing. So we planned really to have a couple of years and then get out what we could. If I had it to do, if I had a couple more years, I'd have a few more beautiful scenes for you, but it's probably good to know when to stop. I want to remind people who may have not seen your entire film tonight, it will be available nationally on PBS.org tomorrow. They can watch it on their Roku or Apple TV or, or at PBS.org with the um, PBS app. But again, congratulations on, on a wonderful film. As we get into our conversation relative to sage grouse tonight, Tom, I want to begin um, with you. Where is Wyoming in its management of sage grouse um, and what's next, broadly? Well, uh, in 2008, uh, then Governor Friedenthal signed an executive order um, uh, specifically for sage grouse that created core areas <clears throat> and the Wyoming strategy. That strategy was um, uh, updated in 2010. Uh, and there was specific guidance within that strategy that uh, it was to remain um, fairly static, especially the core areas themselves, for a five-year period. We're now at that five-year period. We're um, uh, the Sage Grouse Implementation Team, uh, with the assistance of the local organ groups and the eight local organ groups in the state, as well as the public in general, um, have been uh, evaluating the uh, core area policy in the core area maps and looking at new information that has um, come about since 2010 and um, uh, we're nearing the end of that process where the sage grouse implementation team uh, next week will be finalizing their recommendations to the governor for what revisions should be made and then over the course of the summer the governor will be considering those recommendations and uh, uh, deciding how he wants the uh, the executive order to look Holly, you approach this from a perspective of, con of conservation. What are your thoughts on Wyoming's core strategy? Um, you know, I've been, I'm not officially on the team, but have been uh, attending meetings and following that process for several years. And I think overall, I've been really impressed with um, the level of cooperation and collaboration among the team. Um, it has a diverse uh, constituency on it um, from industry, conservation, ag, and it is impressive to watch um, all those people at the table and they don't always agree, of course they don't always agree, but they do work things out in um, you know, a civil and um, meaningful dialogue. And so overall my, my impressions have been, you know, this seems like the way democracy ought to work. Um, you know, maybe, maybe our uh, folks in Washington could learn something from Wyoming. Paul, they certainly have that opportunity. You come from the industry perspective. Your thoughts on Wyoming's policy? Well, uh, first of all, Craig, I want to congr congratulate Mark and Garrett for an outstanding piece of work. Uh, I saw it this morning and was, was incredibly impressed. Thank you so much. So, well done. Uh, Craig, regarding your question, uh, I was 
part of the initial team and remain on that team and, and felt in the early days and certainly feel today that uh, it's an incredibly successful model. You put the right people in the room with the right leadership, then Governor Friedenthal, now Governor Matt Mead, um, certainly Bob Budd as our chairman, and we have proven and continue to prove that we can make great decisions for Wyoming that provide a balance between conservation and our economics. Uh, we did it in 2008, again in 2010, and we certainly will get there this year in 2015. And I think it's important to note that our goal was not to prevent a listing. It was to preclude the need for a listing of sage grouse, and that's a marked difference. And for Wyoming, we've done that. <clears throat> Let's play devil's advocate for just a moment. If the sage grouse is listed, um, what are the ramifications first for industry and then we'll talk about it from an other perspectives. Um, in your view, Paul, what, what, are, what are the ramifications if uh, uh, what some agree is a decision that may, may have the sage grouse as being listed um, relative to the work that's been done, relative to your thoughts in it from an industry perspective? Well, I, starting off, a, a listing I certainly believe, and I know others do too, is, is the worst thing you can do for the bird. We have extensive voluntary conservation measures and now uh, a very extensive regulatory mechanism in place that is doing its job, protecting the bird, enhancing habitat, uh, among other things. Uh, a listing would, quite honestly, certainly be, from an economic standpoint, very damaging to the state of Wyoming. Uh, but also for the bird, and, and that should be taken into consideration. Uh, and for all industry in Wyoming, not simply the oil and gas industry. We currently have roughly 24% of the state protected at a very enhanced level under the core area policy and plan. Uh, a listing would cover three quarters of the state, or Tom, where our numbers over 60% of the state would be treated as core, uh, industry would certainly suffer greatly. Mark, what, you're an outsider, really, yeah. to this perspective. What are your thoughts on how Wyoming has managed um, um, its sage-grouse population and the ramifications of listing? Well, well, you know, Wyoming has the greatest number of sage-grouse, and in that way, you guys have a wealth from our perspective, but also a tremendous burden for the country. I mean, you steward the largest amount of birds in the country, and so a lot of the weight of this issue has fallen on Wyoming and the people of Wyoming. And, and we're, we're certainly aware of that. This is a big issue for the country, and, and the great thing about Wyoming is you guys have provided the model for the country. Everything about this core area management plan is what's been propagating around the other states and beyond sage-grouse into conservation generally over the last five or 10 years. This has become a real model. The question of whether or not it works for this bird in this place is another question. The cooperative agreement that I think has come around is really a tremendous model of how we ought to go about this. I think there, you know, no, nobody wants to see a listing for the reason you mentioned nobody wants to see a listed because we want to see the bird not need listing. Um, you know, the concerns that I think a lot of people have are whether or not we have enough data in place to uh, be certain that the core area management plans and the voluntary measures will actually put this bird on the direction that it needs to in order to survive. Um, and then the other concerns are that other states aren't doing all you are. Um, I mean, call your relatives in other states and say, hey, Wyoming's doing this work, but, you know, ask your governor, are we doing all they're doing? Because a lot of them aren't. And that risks things for people here in Wyoming who are doing a lot of good faith work. Holly, your perspective from the conservation standpoint on what if the bird's listed? Oh, from the, um, <clears throat> um, you know, I think from uh, a, a landowner and ranching point of view right now, you know, there's a lot of opportunities to um, do CCA, candidate conservation agreements, um, and so um, hopefully, you know, and that is a strategy that um, the state has developed so that landowners can sign up for those um, for those candidate conservation agreements um, so that they would be protected in the in the event the bird was listed. A conservation bank, if you will, is that? Um, that, that covers the sort of grazing um, ranching community, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, the conservation banks, which are being developed, uh, have been, there's the Sweetwater Bank that has been developed and approved. And my organization is involved with uh, another process to develop uh, what's called a habitat exchange. It's a different kind of m mitigation mechanism. It's similar, but 
but also different a little bit to the Sweetwater Bank, and it's designed to allow lots of landowners to enroll if they want um, to do good things for grouse and then get credit for doing that. We um, might have a chance to talk about that more in, in a little bit here as the program progresses. Tom, I want to ask you that, um, as Mark kind of indicated, many argue perhaps that more time is needed to decide if Wyoming's strategy is working. Um, and in fact, there's been recent attempt from Western lawmakers to um, um, block an endangered listing um, through various means. Is it too early to tell whether Wyoming's um, um, policies um, are on the right track and will be successful? Uh, well, yes, uh, in, in, in the sense that um, sage grouse and sagebrush habitats are, um, well, sage grouse are long-lived species. They um, have cycles. Uh, the sagebrush habitat is a very, uh, um, tough system to operate in. It's slow to respond to, uh, to management change. Uh, it's very dry, obviously, and uh, poor soils. Uh, so all these things lead to a, a system that is slow to respond. Uh, uh, and just with the, the cycles that sage grouse undergo. Um, uh, you know, for, for example, in, in 2004 when the local working groups were created to 2007 when they were done with their plans, um, they were making plans. Grouse numbers were increasing. Well, gee, is all we had to do was make plans, and grouse numbers increased. Um, and so, and there's been criticism since 2007 and 2008 when the executive order came along that, well, uh, the grouse numbers have declined. Well, you can't blame that on the policy either because there, there's um, the cycles are going on. It was a down phase of the cycle. It was a very dry period. Um, so we need to look at a longer perspective, longer term perspective. And nobody wants to do that. Policymakers, biologists, everybody wants a more instant answer. But the, the biological reality is it, it does take a longer period of time. <clears throat> I want to get to some questions that, that we're getting from our, our viewers, and I appreciate that. I want to remind our viewers that they, they can call us at 800-495-9788 or email us to grouse at wyomingpbs.org. A question from a viewer in Denver. Um, he understands that recent research from the University of Idaho scientist Dr. Edward Garten suggests that sage grouse are headed towards extinction. Extinction. Can you discuss how increase in sage grouse population numbers last year and dramatic increases this year were factored into that analysis? Well, um, those, the last two years were not in that analysis. His data ended at 2013. That's when he started his analysis um, uh, and going backwards um, from that. Uh, but at the same time, uh, short-term increases or decreases really aren't the issue here. Um, uh, it's looking at them, again, in the long term, looking at the peaks and valleys of, of the cycles. And um, so when you look at that analysis and you factor in um, this, the steep declines that started in the 50s and, and continued on uh, through the mid-1990s, certainly if we uh, continued on that path of management, um, we would probably be looking at a very dire um, future for sage grouse. But um, management has changed uh, in the last 20 years um, and, and much more significantly in the last ten, um, eight to 10 years. So. Um, we need to look forward with those kinds of changes in mind and continued change. Um, the, the changes we're doing with the executive order right now uh, are examples of how we're doing adaptive management to try to improve that. So you, um, that needs to be included in the calculation is, is change in management, uh, not just looking at past, and just like a mutual fund. Sure. Uh, past performance is not an indicator of, of the future. How do you agree that the recent short-term um, gains in sagegrass population may not be enough to understand um, global or more in a, from a macro perspective, how Wyoming's policy is um, really working at this point in time. I do agree. I mean, I think you need long-term trend data in order to really gauge um, that. And I think that is clear that that's something that we're going to have to continue to do. Um, uh, I've heard Paul talk about this at the SIGINT meeting about, you know, we need to know if it's working. We need to be monitoring and adjusting. Um, and we all very much hope and believe that it can work. You know, I've, I think we talked on the phone a little bit about this question of is this enough? Is the, is the, is the strategy and the plan enough? Um, and it's something I've thought about a lot and it's something our own research has tried to speak to by growing out energy development and residential development out into the future and then trying to predict, okay, if we do these things for, you know, we do these conservation actions for grouse, does that show that we have indeed done enough to prevent 
further population declines. And that research that we did showed that indeed we greatly stemmed the declines, um, or we predict that we will greatly stem the declines. And of course, they're models and it's, these are difficult things to predict, but if we do the job to continue to monitor our progress, then I think we have every reason to believe that it's enough and it will work. Paul, we've had a viewer from Casper ask the question, <clears throat> what's industry done? What's different today than it was 20 years ago relative to the, to the sage grass, the way sage grasses are managed? Um, also within the question, I think, is um, predator control. Is that an issue for industry? Um, and, and what's industry's, industry's take and really and what's been done? I think over the last 15 to 20 years, and, and certainly in the last 10 years, industry has made great strides in one, understanding uh, the threat uh, to sage grouse and, and to be honest, sagebrush habitat in general and all the obligate species. It's an important issue for us in Wyoming, giving most of Wyoming uh, is in that habitat. and. Most of our oil and gas production, mining, et cetera, it shares that habitat. Uh, also a clear understanding of the threat of a listing. Um, but more so, you're seeing operators that understand long-term sustainability in this state and beyond is good for business. And, and if that is the case, then you've got to be willing to invest significant voluntary funds, time, energy, in conservation and we've seen a, a significant shift in let's get on the ground, get it done, and move out from let's look more towards a sustainability platform to make sure that we can be here for a long haul. And we certainly want that, I know I do. Uh, I know lots of my compatriots in the industry do as well. And a lot of investment in technology driven by innovations in hydraulic fracking, uh, drilling techniques, uh, long directionals, horizontals. Uh, fit drill. for purpose when we drill and when we complete wells. Uh, in looking at the whole basket, how can we shrink our overall initial footprint based on uh, that surface disturbance initially from, from the rigs and what you need and what you can do without and continually shrinking that? Our company invests in rigs that were fit for purpose, that have a smaller footprint. Other companies have different technologies and it's working. We're seeing our overall surface disturbance reduced over where we were from a conventional wisdom standpoint even 10 years ago. I've had a viewer from Cody <clears throat> ask a question and, and he wants each member of the panel to share their view on the biggest hurdle to the success of the future of the sage grass. Mark, we can start with you. What do you think the biggest hurdle is? Um, I think it's time scales. I really, I think it's this question of how do we look at things. It's much faster to develop an oil field than it is to follow the population around it and see whether or not those declines happen. We know that we can develop faster than we can collect the data and the birds can react. We know there's a lot to that. The time scales of our understanding as a, as, as a society, what it's supposed to look like out here, none of us have seen what the sagebrush is supposed to look like. It hasn't looked like that since any of us were born. Um, and so our, our baseline shifts and because of that, as we make changes on the landscape, our children see the landscape in a different way, have a different expectation for what's around them, and things shift over time in a way that, what does it look like two, three hundred years from now? A hundred years from now, do we still have this bird or are we in isolated segments because we made decisions that seemed very wise now but in fact didn't work out for us so well. And it took decades and decadal cycles for us to see that that was the case. We don't do conservation on a precautionary way in this country. We make our best guess about how this will probably work and we try and forge ahead and push ahead with development. But for an animal like this that moves along slower, catches up or doesn't catch up uh, to these cycles, I think time is really the challenge. Paul? Honestly, a listing would be the biggest hurdle for conservation for the bird for reasons we spoke about earlier. All of the efforts that Wyoming, uh, uh, from a state perspective, from a local perspective, from an agricultural perspective, and an industry perspective, have put into conservation uh, in earnest uh, for the last decade uh, would be at threat with a listing. We're doing good work in Wyoming. Let us continue to do it. Same question, Holly. What's the biggest hurdle to the future of the sage grouse? I think the uncertainty with climate is a huge challenge and what 
um, cheatgrass and other exotic annuals um, could do to the landscape um, that have done to places warmer. And we've seen this in some places in, in Wyoming where, where, where it has warmed up, like the Bighorn Basin, and we see a lot more cheatgrass. Uh, and sort of that uncertainty and how it might affect the uh, other places that right now have remained relatively relatively cheatgrass free and sort of composed of the native ecosystem. And if that shifts dramatically under our feet, I think that's going to be an enormous challenge. Tom, you've been at this a long time. What's the biggest hurdle for the sage grouse? Well, first I'm going to agree with the other panelists. I think those are all uh, very valid uh, uh, concerns and just to rank those, it would be tough. On, on a range-wide, looking at it from a satellite view, not just not from a Wyoming view, I think the, <clears throat> the wildfire and cheatgrass issue to the west is probably the biggest immediate threat. Um, uh, but, uh, but I would uh, um, agree with Paul that a listing um, wouldn't necessarily be in the grouse's favor, best interest because, um, and, and I've said this in many forums, but never to a live TV audience, uh, um, but I've never had anyone correct the statement that this conservation effort for sage grouse is the lar largest single species conservation effort ever undertaken. And a listing would say, well, the largest conservation effort ever undertaken for a single species failed. And what message would that send? What would conservation, would, a, would an endangered species listing actually improve conservation above what is arguably at least the largest conservation effort ever undertaken? Um, I think that's a, a, a rhetorical question um, mm -hmm. that we all need to grapple with. I had a viewer from Casper um, call with a question for you, Mark, and, and he wants me to ask you if you feel you adequately represented the damage done by oil and gas industries and by subdivision developers' uh, uh, impact on sagebrush step areas. Well, I, we, didn't make an, we didn't make an issue film. I think we were very careful. We wanted people, we saw our role to create concern and interest, raise the regard for the ecosystem, raise the perceived value of the ecosystem. And we wanted to touch on the factors that are really important, but we also didn't make a film about Wyoming and the issues in Wyoming. We did make it here, but don't tell people in other states that. We actually made it so it would work in all the 11 states to help people understand what's around them. And the issues are different in different places, and people don't see them the same. What we wanted is a film that people could show and then talk about Here's how we think in our state or in our local area we need to address this so that we can do more for this really great place. So no, we didn't, we didn't address any of the impacts in a way that goes after those impacts. It's just not what we tried to do. We've got three viewers now. Um, Tom and I'll, I'll, I'll have you uh, talk about this question. A viewer from Laramie, a viewer from Rollins, and a viewer from Cody. Essentially ask, why do we continue to have a hunting season on the sage grouse? Well, um, uh, there's several reasons, really. Uh, first of all, hunting um, has been uh, evaluated. Um, it ranks very lowly, low on a scale of potential threats. Um, the, the reason sage, one of the reasons that sage grouse uh, are warranted for listing is the lack of regulatory mechanism. We have a, a very good regulatory mechanism for hunting. Um, a lot of times uh, when this question comes up, really it's, it's kind of a dichotomy of either yes or no. Well, how about a, a regulated? So we're not trying to tell any other user out there, and um, you know, as Wyoming we pride ourselves on a multiple use state. We're not saying no to very much. We're trying to find our way to yes, and it's, it's, it's not been identified as a threat. Um, and in fact, closing hunting when, it, when it's um, not biologically necessary actually sends the wrong message that, um, boy, these birds are in trouble. If you can't hunt a game bird, then they probably deserve to be listed. They probably uh, are at the point that they should be listed. So um, I think that would send the wrong message. Um, but biologically, it just simply isn't necessary because it's such a tightly controlled uh, um, hunting season. On board with that perspective, Holly? I am, and I actually have a question for Tom. <laughs> Can I do that? Sure, <laughs> Is that allowed? Yeah, allowed. Um, uh, from the Game and Fish's perspective, when you manage sage grouse hunting, do you adjust the levels of hunting allowed based on the sizes of the populations in the state? Well, uh, the answer is yes and no. Uh, um, yes, uh, all of the local working group plans, the state plan, have those kinds of thresholds built into them, but 
frankly, we've been hard, we've been hunting at the very conservative end of that, uh, and and not adjusting when times are good, not allowing additional heart because of these kind of concerns. Mm -hmm. So um, it's become more and more conservative, but we've never liberalized in the face of in the good years. So um, I'd say, like in the Powder River Basin, where the populations aren't as robust. Right. Are the levels of hunting allowed? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, it's more a, more tightly controlled. Yeah, there. it's de facto that way because simply because of the private land, uh, there's very little access. So, um, uh, but it's only a three-day hunting season um, and very little access, very little harvest. Um, so. Also later in the fall, perhaps than it used to be years ago. Is is that accurate? It is. It's um, it's uh, conducted later in September. Traditionally, sage grouse hunting was done. <clears throat> It was a Labor Day family activity, um, but uh, uh, we learned some things about uh, that harvest was focused on the, the successful hens um, and their chicks. By moving it later, uh, it spreads the birds out, makes them more difficult to hunt, and, and you spread the harvest out over a broader, um, all, over all the population instead of targeting those successful hens. A viewer from Lander asks a, a question that others perhaps have thought about. Why not raise sage hens in captivity and just release them? Why doesn't that work, or why isn't that part of the plan? Anyone want to take that? Uh, my understanding is it's been tried with limited success. Is that right, Tom? Well, th there's, uh, it, yeah, they're a very difficult species to raise in captivity because they're a, they, different breeding season, their diet um, uh, requirements, and so forth. There has been experimentation, especially in, in Colorado, um, with the technique. But bottom line is, um, we still have. Um, tens of thousands of birds, hundreds of thousands of birds. Uh, it's not uh, a species at the point of needing that, that kind of a thing to save it, like the black-footed ferret would be an example. Now, in Canada right now, they, they do have a, a captive rearing program um, underway, um, more from a scientific standpoint to see if they can do it. But they're down to literally handfuls of birds. Question from a, a viewer. Mark, I'll, I'll let you start here. Um, you've been in Jackson, in Pinedale, in Lander, here in Riverton, visiting with people. Her question is, is she wasn't aware the sage grass was in danger. Um, um, more awareness is needed. What can individuals do from your perspective to begin to make a difference if they haven't already? And everyone from your perspective can get in on this question. I think being aware, I mean, it's so exciting to hear somebody become aware from the film that we had and from this discussion. Being aware across the 11 states and really across the country of this issue as it rises in the rankings of your Google News search over the next six months. Know about it and care about it. Share the documentary. Follow what's happening here at, the, at, at PBS. Also, with some great reporting in Wyoming on Wyofile. Uh, there's some really great in-depth work being done that can help you follow what's happening and develop your own opinion about what should happen uh, here in your state, especially at home. But then, we really think, send our film I hate to be so advertising, but send it to people and say, this is my backyard. Send it to your friends who live in Maine and to your friends who live in California. This is my backyard. This is what I'm proud of. This is where I live. Um, so that other people around the country know what this place is and why it's so beautiful and why we in the rest of the country ought to care about what happens here. To me, that's really important. That's why we made the film and obviously why we think we can make a difference. How does industry listen when people have concerns or are, are our thoughts about issues like this? Well, in several ways, and I, I agree with Mark uh, on most of his points, except for I would suggest people come to Wyoming and... Good point. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Correction. Um, and, and come, you know, come visit Pinedale. Come visit some of the communities where you have oil and gas development and you have sage, you know, uh, sage grouse populations and see that there can be, uh, there can be a balance. Uh, and we'd love to host people in the field to demonstrate that and show exactly what we talked about earlier, how through innovation we can reduce our overall impacts and, and how that can benefit uh, you know, the entire habitat. Um, from an industry standpoint, it's critical that we do listen. Uh, and a lot of companies have listening sessions, they're attending meetings. We have seen tremendous participation uh, from the industry at the local working group level up to the SIGIT level. And, and certainly back in Washington, D.C. at a higher level, um, sharing our viewpoint, uh, listening uh, and, and learning from the conservation community uh, on how we can continue to work better 
and work together. We have about 20 minutes left in our discussion tonight. I want to remind viewers that we can still take questions. We've had um, many given to us and we're thankful for that, but give us a call at 800-495-9788 if you have questions you would like us to relate to the panel, or if you want to send those via email to grouse at wyomingpbs.org, we would still love to hear from you tonight. There's still time. Um, let's talk a little bit um, about um, what might happen. Congress last year voted to withhold funding if the um, sage grouse was listed. In your view, what does that mean? If the sage grouse is listed, yet Congress has precluded funding from allowing it really to be implemented. What are your thoughts about that? Tom, I'll start with you. Um, well, I haven't closely followed the national legislation. I mean, it, it's, it's ebbs and flows, and, and uh, uh, when there's final decisions and I have to deal with them, I guess I will. But Th that would be a concern if, if funding were to, to dry up for conservation efforts. Um, that would be counterproductive. Um, uh, uh, so we wouldn't want that to happen, obviously, because um, there are national scale efforts like the NRCS um, uh, Sage Grouse Initiative that that's, uh, um, involves hundreds of millions of dollars uh, working with private landowners across the West um, that's improving not only sage grouse habitat but also conditions for um, for the rancher themselves. Things like removing juniper um, where it has come in encroached on sage brush habitat. Uh, that's a benefit both for a rancher and for sage grouse. So th if those kinds of things were to go away, that would be completely counterproductive. Holly, what are your thoughts? Um, I, I agree with Tom and I um, you know, worry specifically about, about the funding for these programs. Um, you know, private landowners are being asked to do a lot in this um, for sage grouse as part of this strategy uh, to be partners and I think they very much are stepping up and they're stepping up with the help of these national programs. Um, they, uh, there was a study done in Oregon that showed that uh, you know 80 percent of the riparian lands were in uh, private private hands so they play in sage grouse come down to the as as was shown in the film they come down to these wet areas in search of forbs um, with their chicks so these wet pri uh, areas that are largely in the hand of private landowners are really imp important piece of the puzzle so um, funding that helps them put conservation easements on those lands that helps them do you know other grazing practices fencing water um, and then they put ramps to so that sage grouse can escape from water tanks they're doing a lot to try to help them manage their ranches and so I do worry that um, if that funding was removed and those programs went away it would sort of remove the, um, the thing that's the support mechanism that helps can help those private landowners be those important partners. Viewers asked the question, well, oh go ahead. I was just going to say I think Tom it's really Tom is right don't worry about the stuff going on in Washington right now don't worry about it it's all crazy you know politics what, what's happening here in your meetings that you're having about what you do with your land that's where that's what's going to matter really in the long run and I think you have to have faith in that process it's going so well that's also the question of the listing decision you can't it's what's out there but it's not what we should really be talking about we should be talking about the decisions that still have to be made here in Wyoming mm -hmm to do the right thing to keep this bird on the right track. And those are the decisions that these guys debate in fine scale and are actually incredibly interesting and important. Core area, expansion, contraction, boundaries, wintering areas, things that I think are incredibly important that are harder to grapple with than talk about than the endangered species listing or not. Let's talk about um, core areas and, and, and um, some areas that may or may not be part of Wyoming's defined core areas. In anyone's opinion, are there areas that m maybe should be added to this list? Um, that process comes to um, fruition next week. Um, where are the areas that aren't part of the core area management plan today that should be added to the list, or conversely, should any areas be removed? Um, well, yeah, I'll take that one first anyway, because that's that was my task uh, from the from the SIGIT was to. Uh, um, uh, chair the subgroup of the the um, implementation team looking at this gather input from the local working groups and the public and so the, the SIGIT here a couple weeks ago in Douglas made some decisions for about half of the state um, and the the net was to add several areas um, that had um, uh, good numbers of sage grouse large numbers um, in the uh, Fontenelle area 
um, down by bags in uh, along the uh, slope of the uh, Sierra Madres, um, and a couple other um, smaller areas, and some some minor uh, uh, reductions in core where the habitat. Um, wasn't good or there's existing disturbance that didn't meet the definition of core area. Tom, real quickly, does summer habitat and winter habitat get equal footing in these discussions? Oh, certainly in the discussions, yes. Uh, it, in 2010, one of the directions from uh, then Governor Friedenthal for that revision was to uh, not simply look at the breeding habitat, the lex and, and the associated nesting and early early brood rearing habitats, was to, but to look at all the seasonal habitat needs of the sage grouse. Thankfully, um, with, with sage grouse, because they start to breed so early in the spring, it, it usually um, in most of the state, their wintering areas are pretty close to where they're going to start lecking. That's not always the case. There are a couple of exceptions. And so that's been a topic of discussion this spring. Holly, where are you at? Is enough land set aside in the core plan, more need to be added? How's that process work from your perspective? Um, well, I sat on this mapping uh, group that was working on those, some of those adjustments with Tom and uh, was very excited to see some of the additions that, um, that did make it through the last um, round of, of, of the SIGIT meeting. Um, we were particularly uh, supportive uh, from the, this bags um, core area that he was talking about. Um, is an area that we've been, the Conservancy has been working with those local landowners, and that is one of the largest unprotected areas for grouse that had been out of core and is now, looks like it will be added to core, and the group approved that. So we were very excited about that decision um, in particular, and there were some other really good additions um, that we, we thought needed to be made, and the group made them. <clears throat> you might have been asked a question similar to this by a student in, in, in your, um, uh, yesterday or the day before. Um, I think I've, if I heard the summary, the uh, correct uh, question was, why should we care if the bird goes extinct? This question is a little more focused. Is it, what would be the ultimate consequence of the sage grouse if it were to become extinct? And is that truly determinable? Why or why not? Yeah, I think you, you can try and, you can't put a dollar value on this species. I mean, there are species where you can try and do some math and econo e economists can come in and say, listen, you know, we, the ecosystem service provided by this animal in this place, uh, you know, that's worth X. The sage grouse is not one of those animals that is backed up by is ecosystem system because they, this is a very lean landscape already. Um, they, we don't, they don't keep the landscape in shape for us. We keep the landscape in shape for them, I mean, fundamentally. And so this isn't one of those animals that you can say, listen, if it's gone, we, you know, the apocalypse is going to happen, and the, it, it, it's bad for other species around it, but it's here because it's here, and that's, we have to protect it. That's the nature of the ethic that we have uh, in this country. The Endangered Species Act, you know, codified that. And so the truth of the matter is, it, it's important, and the loss of it would be tremendous from the perspective of those who care about the natural resources, the natural history resources of the country. And we've lost grouse species all across this continent over the last 150 years. Um, it started up in the Northeast. We lost the, 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 um, the heath hen. We're down the greater prairie, greater prairie chicken, lesser prairie chicken. There are populations blinking out in Texas and, um, and elsewhere. And what we have is the Gunnison sage grouse, obviously at a much more critical situation than the greater sage grouse. Um, it's spreading. These species blink out like a lot of other things over a long time scale. And I guess the question to us is, do we want to live in a place where we allow species to just disappear unless they have a financial value for us, and a lot of people in this country don't think so. Holly or Tom, what's your perspective? Um, what would the ultimate consequences be from your perspective if, if in fact, they were to become extinct? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, I can't argue with that. I don't know that we have a biological, if this bird went extinct, this would be the ecological ramifica ramifications of it, but the, um, the conservation loss, the ethical, moral, um, this species just isn't here and I can't take my children to see a lek and I, you know, the, that uh, aesthetic and um, environmental loss, I think, it stands on its own. We have a uh, viewer um, who noticed that we don't have a rancher on the panel or, or the ranching industry um, represented and, and I agree with that. That said, um, what are the issues relative to um, ranchers um, 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 that we should be concerned about? Um, 
They obviously raise cattle, they, are, they graze, they are, they've been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, some may argue that um, even more so than industry, um, um, grazing and in, in, in what uh, um, happens um, because of ranching is maybe even more important here. Any perspective on r issues relative to the sage grouse and ranching? I'll give it, give it a shot. Um, uh, certainly if, if uh, grazing is done improperly, um, that can have a, a huge um, impact, a negative impact on sage grouse habitat. Um, but if done um, properly, and, and of course devil is in the details on what that actually means, um, uh, but I truly believe that you can have sustainable ranching and sustainable sage grouse populations. It takes some work um, uh, and knowledge and skillfully applying uh, those grazing techniques, but I, I truly believe it's, it's possible. What are your thoughts relative to grazing issues in sage grouse, Holly? Yeah, no, I, I think the data show that, uh, and have continued to show that heavy prolonged grazing uh, is not good and that well-managed uh, grazing is perfectly compatible with grouse and in fact um, is good for ranchers too. I mean, it, it yields, you know, a sustainable ranching operation. So. Uh, the NRCS has a, a phrase, uh, what's good for the bird is good for the herd. And um, I, I think that's, that's true. Mark, your perspective, your film touched on yeah. um, these issues. I mean, that's obviously true. There's a lot of great programs also for ranchers. There's more money going into that uh, from the federal side than anything else about this, finding ways to help ranchers ranch sustainably. And we can make differences that are actually positive for both. There are areas that shouldn't be grazed. Um, just from the perspective, they can't, you can't improve raising, grazing everywhere. Uh, there are areas that should be taken offline, and there are programs to help do that and financially compensate people. That is not a popular thing to say. Uh, but there are dollars around to retire grazing allotments. There are dollars for places where we really shouldn't be grazing because it can't be done sustainably. Um, and that's really important. One of the simplifications in the film was to describe uh, the, the West as having been grazed by buffalo in the past. And that's a romantic vision. Truthfully, buff buffalo weren't supported in a lot of these areas because there was never enough grass. It's simply too much of a desert. And yet it's enough for the sage grouse when you have high enough grass. So, I mean, the answer is yes. What's good for the bird is good for the herd in a lot of areas. We should continue to invest in those. But we should also allow some allotments to retire and be help those people so that we can take some of these areas that would be great sage grouse habitat. There's no oil underneath them. We could do a lot by propping those areas up and taking cattle off the land. Well, we've had a viewer ask a question with as much as, as industry is reported to have done and with as many dollars as industry is reported to have uh, put into sage grouse conservation. Should industry be doing more? Is it, is it, is it um, meeting, I think, is the, um, um, its requirements, or are there, is there more for industry to do relative to sage grass uh, management and conservation? Well, I'd say there's more for all of us to do. Uh, we're learning, we're evolving, uh, not only as a sage grass implementation team, but as, as the industry, as conservation, as science, and new science you know, comes to light. Certainly from our perspective, uh, you know, what we can do now versus what we could do 10 years ago, uh, there's a marked difference in how we can continue to reduce our impacts. And uh, the industry is always looking at ways of improving uh, and, and figuring out ways we can reduce those impacts, whether it's through technology or collaboration or partnerships. So short answer, yes. Uh, but I would say that for all of us. Sure. A uh, viewer from Casper um, writes that she's a lifelong resident of Wyoming and has spent lots of times in the southern half of the Bighorn Mountains over the past 45 years. There were lots more sage grass around in the past and only the change in that remote area are the, the drought and more predators. Um, can you comment on why there is still a decline in numbers there um, in that part of Wyoming? Sure, I'll give it, uh, give it a, a shot again. Um, um, you know, sage grouse are, are a landscape species. Um, they occupy huge areas, and, and a lot of the birds on the southern end of the bighorns are going up there, migrating up there in the summer, but their leks are down in the lower areas. Uh, on the western side um, uh, of the bighorns in the bighorn basin, there are some huge wildfire and cheatgrass areas that have come about um, since that period. Um, 
you know, so there's there is an example. Um, you know, we the P word has been talked about, uh, mentioned a couple times, but nobody's really addressed it yet. And I, I would put forth that that uh, that the core area policy itself. Uh, is a predator management policy, and that is because a lot of the predators that we're concerned about, um, ravens, um, um, is, is a, the classic example, and was mentioned in, in the film. Uh, they're using our, they're the exact opposite of sage grouse. They're using our human infrastructure um, to, um, to increase their numbers. Um, they like hanging around us. Um, so by um, limiting our uh, infrastructure in the core areas, we are limiting raven habitat um, and other pre uh, predators like that, skunks, raccoons, those kinds of things that like to live with people. Question about restoration has been um, brought forth. What is restoration? What does it look like? Um, is it feasible to restore habitat in Wyoming? And I think we need to ask, is it different in different parts of Wyoming? Harley, yeah, I'll, I'll let you. I can take a stab at that. Um, uh, you know, uh, I have the fortune of being out on a reclamation site uh, yesterday with uh, Pete Guernsey from QEP to see some of his uh, restoration. And I have to say, I mean, after 10 years, it was very impressive to see the uh, native plants there, the, the sagebrush coming back, the forbs. Um, and he was quite proud of his work, and I think he had every reason to be. Um, so I think successful restoration um, certainly can be done. And he emphasized that he's learning all the time, that he continues to you know, perfect his methods. And so, um, you know, that's a place that's blessed with a little more moisture than other places in the state. And I think we're really challenged by places that have a lot of cheatgrass uh, with less moisture. Um, I'm part of the Douglas Core Area Restoration Team, and that's an area with a lot less moisture. They're doing some really innovative, interesting uh, plant. They're growing sagebrush in greenhouses and planting them and, uh, you know, trying to learn how to plant in those areas. Um, and I think it is still, you know, it is it's ex experimental, um, but uh, it can be done. I, you know, I, I wonder about the, the, the driest, you know, most cheatgrass prone areas. I think we're going to be challenged by those. I can't say we can't figure out a way. But, um, you know, we'll have a lot to learn, but um, I think there's a lot of promise, too. Industry have comments on restoration? Craig, absolutely, and I'm glad you asked. It's a significant part of what we do uh, on a daily basis to make sure we are reducing our impacts, and we've had some, some very good success. It can be done right, and it can work, and we've proven it in the Jonah field. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we're, we're one of the only operators out there that has been able to achieve rollover credit from the BLM for acreage that is considered now fully really reclaimed. And to put that in perspective, uh, some of those locations are less than 10 years old. So it, it can be done. We're doing it in Jonah. Now granted, we, we think we've you know, invested a tremendous amount of time and energy into doing it. Uh, but if you do it right, uh, it, we can get habitat back quicker and, and certainly with some of the seed mixes that are developed out there that are weed free and good best management practices, you can do it right. What are your thoughts on restoration, Mark? The best restoration is preservation. I mean, it's much better to not lose it and there's so much great habitat out there still. Not to lose is a lot better. And there are some areas here that are, that are gorgeous and wonderful and slated for development and it would be much better just simply not develop them. Uh, one of them is in the near, next to the Jonah Energy Field, the NPL, or what we like to call the Alkali Basin, from the people that like to stay on the top of it. Um, that's an area that we worry a lot about the development of it. I'm not really interested in seeing it restored in 50 years. We're interested in seeing an area like that stay offline and the birds can you know, stay there and be there without the need for experimental programs of seed grasses and sprout removal, whatever it is. We'd like to just see some places left to the birds. We've had, oh, go ahead, Holly. I just Holly. wanted to chime in, too, the, you know, thinking about it. I mean, the benefit of having the large companies is that they can invest money in really good reclamation. Not all companies are large and have those resources, so I think we're also challenged by, um, by that fact, um, you know. And I would like to respond to that. I think one of the ways the industries work together is a, a yearly reclamation uh, conference and then constant communication among the operators to make sure that companies large and small, uh, multinational to local independents, uh, have a full suite of tools that, that, uh, that larger companies in the past have developed. We're not a large company either at this point. Um, sharing knowledge and information throughout the industry 
uh, on sage grouse issues and, and surface disturbance issues and technology has really changed the game. We've had a couple questions um, come in just in the last minute or two, and we only have a little over a minute left relative to essentially, and we've talked about this already, so I apologize to our viewers, but, but let's, let's end on this again, if we could. Wouldn't it be better to list the birds, is, is the, uh, um, both of these questions. We've talked about it a little bit. Um, quickly again, Tom, reiterate. Uh, Your thoughts about just, that? Yeah, quickly, no, um, because uh, again, we're already doing the largest conservation effort ever. And Holly, from the conservation perspective? Yeah, I, I mean, I think this has been an incredible, the, the, co the collaborative effort from the SIGIT, uh, we have every reason to believe it will work based on the science that created the plan, and um, I think we should let that process play out. And Mark, ag again, your perspective. Oh yeah, no, I don't think anybody wants to see this. And I, Tom is right, this is by far, I'll back you up on this, the largest in the history of the U.S. And I've heard the Secretary of the Interior say that, so you can say it. It is the biggest. They say worldwide. You, well, worldwide, <laughs> I'll, even give you, I'll even give you worldwide. This is epic and important and critical, and the fact that people are coming together to do this well is really exciting, but other states have to follow Wyoming's lead. That's really where, mm -hmm. I know we're about Wyoming, but there are other states not doing what you're doing, and that could you know, poison the well for everybody. I appreciate that. As we wrap up tonight's discussion, I want to remind our viewers that you can view again Nature's The Sagebrush Sea beginning tomorrow on PBS.org or by using your Roku or Apple TV and the PBS app. Also, we will place this Wyoming Perspectives panel discussion online as well. Our thanks to our viewers who submitted questions and to our panel, Mark um, Dan Dansker, Holly Copeland, Paul Ulrich, and Tom Christensen. Thank you all for this vital discussion. I'm Craig Blumenshine from Wyoming PBS and from all of us here tonight, have a good e evening.